Hey everyone, Ranger William here from the Overmountain Victory National Historic Trail, bringing you part three of our series, That Hated Scotsman, Patrick Ferguson as a soldier, officer, and leader in the American Revolution. Now, the reason we're talking about this guy is to get a kind of a better understanding of who Patrick Ferguson was. Um, let's cut through the two and a half centuries of, of legend and stories. Let's go back to some original letters uh, from him to his family, from him to his superiors. Um, let's see who this guy really was and why it was so important, why it was such a big deal that he was killed at the Battle of Kings Mountain on October 7th, 1780, and why those three little words on the, on the marker at the battlefield, here Ferguson fell, why that changed the British course of the Southern Campaign. So our first part, episode one, part one, we talked about his childhood. We talked about his background of Edinburgh, Scotland, the Enlightenment thinkers outside the box asking questions. We talked about his military career of the Seven Years' War, dragoons, uh, mounted raiding and skirmishing, and catching synovial tuberculosis at 17. We talked about his, um, his the, this long lethargy, is how he called it, um, his recovery, getting involved with the, um, the pro-Scottish militia movement, these kind of debate groups at the poker club, um, writing articles against some parliamentary law under pseudonyms, things like Eggshell, Memento Mori, John Bull, and he wants to have adventure and action and see the empire, and he gets his wish. Uh, part two, we talked about him getting uh, different parts of the British Empire, light infantry service, um, purchasing the estate on Tobago, uh, the light infantry training school. We talked about his improvements to a breech loading rifle. And there's so much hope, so much potential for this idea, his experimental core of riflemen and how that all comes crashing down with his injury at Brandywine, losing the use of his right arm, losing his rifle core, but still trying to prove himself outside the box. Um, all different ideas, raiding privateer harbors, um, surprise attacks against uh, the Pulaski's Legion at Little Egg Harbor, and now he's been given his commission in the 71st Highlanders on October 25th, 1779. So part three, this is where we're going to get to uh, the real relevant part of our story here when Ferguson comes south. So in 1779, shortly after getting this uh, promotion to the uh, major of the 71st Highlanders, he is going to get permission to form the American Volunteers. Now, that's in November. Uh, who these guys are, they are uh, they're loyalists, they're American colonists who are already in service with other provincial units, men like the New York Volunteers, New Jersey Volunteers, these kind of groups that are under the British Army, um, equipped and armed, but they are Americans. Um, so they're going, he's going to call for volunteers for this special mission down to help capture Charleston. He's going to get this regiment. And on December 16th, 1779, there's this, um, this odd little paperwork note that they are issued 200 serviceable rifles. Now, the odds are, from those I've spoke with, um, spoken with, the odds are that these are not the Ferguson rifles. Um, odds are these are the British 1776 Ordnance Pattern Rifle, those 1,000 rifles that were commissioned back in 1776, uh, muzzle loaders copied after the rifles used by the uh, Hessian Jaeger Corps. Um, but odds are that's what we're looking at here. Uh, and that's what I'm going to say until I find contrary evidence. Um, so if you hear of anything, send me an email. Now, December 24th, 1779, these American volunteers with some of these rifles, they get on board some transport ships in New York Harbor, and they set sail for Georgia. Uh, they're going to arrive in February of 1780 off the coast of Tybee Island, just outside of Savannah. And throughout those next couple months, February, March, April, they're going to be part of the British campaign coming along the coast uh, from the from Savannah through Low Country, South Carolina, to uh, besiege and capture Charleston, South Carolina, the main target for this whole campaign. And within that city, massive city, very wealthy city, is the entire Southern Continental Army. So two birds with one stone right here. Um, all the eggs are in a nice little basket, and it's going to be Ferguson and some of the other provincials who are in charge of closing off 
that basket. Um, the British Legion under Bannister Tarleton, the American Volunteers under Patrick Ferguson are going all through the Low Country trying to close off any chance of the Patriots, the rebels escaping, and any chance of reinforcements arriving for the, for the Americans. Um, now, it's during this Low Country uh, movements and these raids that on March 14th, 1780, at McPherson's Plantation, you actually get these two groups, the British Legion and American Volunteers, pursuing some reported uh, rebels in the area. They end up finding each other in the dark, and a friendly fire incident is going to happen. Um, during this clash, in that dark, you get some co uh, close quarters fighting. Ferguson is actually bayoneted in his good arm, in his left arm, um, by one of the British Legion soldiers. Uh, Lieutenant McPherson of the British Legion, he's going to get bayoneted twice, actually, by some of the American volunteers. Um, by the time they realize what's happening and put a ceasefire, uh, two of the American volunteers have been killed, one of the British Legion has been killed, and several on both sides are described as badly wounded. Um, so uh, an unfortunate incident just when you're dealing in the low country, in the dark, in the swamps, new terrain, um, especially if these men are a little panicky, a little jumpy about being ambushed, this is what happens. Now on April 14th, you have another um, interaction with civilians. Now, it's going to be interesting to see how the American volunteers officers describe it. Um, you have four women who come into their camp um, after being assaulted by one of the soldiers of the British Legion. Um, they are going to, uh, they were all staying together at uh, Lady Colleton's plantation. Um, the other women, you have Lady Colleton, also Betsy Giles, Jean Russell, and a Mrs. Faye Sue, all are described as coming into the American Volunteers camp, the officers taking them under their protection, um, the doctors seen to them, and just fury, just rage at these British Legion soldiers for allowing this to happen, for that one guy for committing any the assault. Um, they're going to want this man uh, immediately punished. He's, he's arrested, he's put in irons, and he's sent down to Charleston to face court-martial. Um, but they're going to stay with the, stay with the women. They're going to stay with the American volunteers uh, for for a, a day or two um, and try and get them to a safe place where they can uh, be left behind. Uh, and these guys can keep on going on with the campaign. So that was in April. Um, in May, you see these guys get back into the the main heart of combat. Um, on May second, you're going to see um, the uh, American volunteers. They're part of uh, the coastal defenses around Charleston, so especially Fort Moultrie. This is going to be this kind of famous post out on Sullivan's Island. This is the uh, the half-finished palmetto log in sand fort that helped turn back the British fleet back in 1776. Now the fortification is complete, but it's going to be captured. It actually surrenders to a landing party of the Royal Navy, and it's going to be handed over to Ferguson and the American volunteers to help garrison that. Um, now, during his uh, his time here, again, Ferguson, with all of his ideas, constantly writing to Sir Henry Clinton about how to best do the siege, how to best capture the city. Again, artillery and engineering is his specialty from the, uh, the military academy, um, but constant letters going to get him assigned this kind of special mission, um, the Inspector of Militia on May 22nd, 1780. That's what Ferguson is going to be given this little mission from uh, Sir Henry Clinton um, and talking about all these ideas, uh, Colonel Nesbitt Balfour actually calls them a wild and dangerous ideas, another British officer Ferguson is serving with. Um, now, once they he's given this commission, this, this new job of the inspector, what does that mean? Um, so they're going to head inland. As one of his other officers, Dr. Uzel Johnson, he writes on, on, on August 28th, 1780, he says, quote, expecting hourly to receive news from Colonel Ferguson, who had promised to do his best to get us all relieved from the disagreeable service in the backwoods. So they are out there, they're in the interior of South Carolina, they're trying to organize and train the Loyalist militia to best defeat the remaining rebels. Um, so August 28th, Dr. Johnson writing about how they're waiting to hear back. They don't want to be out there anymore. They want to be back with the main army, back in Charleston, maybe even all the way back in New York City. But on August 29th, the next day, Johnson notes in his diary, quote, Now we began to see our destiny was fixed to do duty in the backwoods, separate from the main army, with the militia. End quote. So kind of resigned to this service. Um, 
the idea that Ferguson has here, he spent all this summer of 1780 chasing after groups of rebel partisans, is the best way to describe them. Small bands mounted on good horses with accurate rifles, quick raids, ambushes. They're hard to catch because of their, their, their horses. Um, they're very deadly, deadly accurate because of their rifles. And Ferguson says, these loyalist militia have the same skills. Why aren't we using them in that same way? He says, um, even at the Battle of Camden, August 16th, 1780, he writes to Cornwallis and he says, look, if we had been using loyalist militia in these small mounted bands, they could have pursued the American army after their defeat and been capturing them for days so that none of them would have escaped. There wouldn't be an American army left if we had used my plan. So, I mean, hindsight's 2020. Um, it's easy to say how great things could have been, but he does kind of have a point. Um, these Patriot groups are very hard to catch. Their speed, their ability is, is hard to deny. Um, so he wants to use loyalists in the same way. Now, on August 29th, 1780, Ferguson is going to kind of explain why loyalist militia have such a bad reputation with British officers. He says that their poor performance is not due to their own fault, but it's due to bad management by British leaders. He says, quote, it was of course to be expected that a mongrel mob without any regularity or even organization, without fidelity, without officers, without any previous preparation employed against the enemy, as is, of course, they would bring the name of militia into discredit. And he has some ideas about how to use them. He says it's easier to use militia when they're away from home. When these guys are serving in their own community, of course they're going to disobey. Of course they're going to pop over back home for dinner or for the night and be back in the morning. Go check on their farms and then come back. They won't be disciplined if they're in their own neighborhood. He also says don't use a big group. Use a small force. Um, big groups of these guys, they're too unwieldy. They're, they're too hard to supply. Um, he says make small groups in support of each other. Uh, Ferguson says another militia force similar to his about a day's march to his west would create these kind of fingers of the British Army going up towards North Carolina. Ferguson is in a day's ride of Cornwallis. This other group can be in a day's ride of him. So worst case scenario, two days, both groups are back with the main army. Um, this is his great uh, kind of his pitch that he's making to Lord Cornwallis. Now, um, one thing that he's finding as Ferguson is going through these communities is that uh, the people have often been misled by the rebels. That's how he's always presenting it. He says that he is explaining to the people all the British peace offers that were made, um, which there were quite a few after the uh, American victory at Saratoga. Um, the British government wanting to end the war quickly in North America to better fight the French. Um, pretty much everything the American rebels were wanting other than independence is being offered by the British. Representation, no taxation other than what your, their own assemblies would pass. Um, it's just the independence thing, that's the sticking point now. Um, the British will give everything but that. And the Americans say, well, that's the, kind of the point now. Um, but when Ferguson says he explains this to the, uh, the local people in the back country, the Carolinas, um, that they have not heard of these offers. They have not heard of this discussion. Um, one of his proclamations actually points out uh, that you worry about religious freedom, um, but here is Great Britain, one of the kind of the champions of the Protestant religion in the world, and the Americans are aligned with Catholic France. Um, they're courting Catholic Spain. Um, so to your average Protestant British subject, um, this seems like a, like a horrible idea. Um, so Ferguson is making a big deal about that. Now, he's also noting all of the poor conditions of the Loyalists, how much they've suffered at the hands of the American rebels. On September 5th, 1780, one of Ferguson's officers notes that they stopped at the home of a Mr. Coleman. Um, he's a Loyalist. Two of his sons are actually in the uh, provincial regiment under Lord Cornwallis. And he says, quote, they have been greatly distressed by the rebels for their loyalty. The house stripped of all the beds and other furniture and the children of all their clothes. Now, on September 7th, 1780, Ferguson gets a chance to kind of really show um, how he's listening 
to his own officers. Um, he actually kind of gets a, uh, a, a petition from his militia officers saying that we don't like how the militia is being operated. We don't like some of the rules, the regulations. These are our ideas. This is what we want to happen. And Ferguson, he meets with them. He discusses it. He agrees. He's like, yeah, this makes perfect sense. And he sends their, their kind of requests, their ideas on to Lord Cornwallis with his full support saying, look, these guys know the best way to make this happen. They know the biggest problems. Let's make sure that we can make sure that they stay happy. They stay in our service. Now, Ferguson is also going to write about how important it is to have good intelligence. Um, he notes in one of his proclamations to, to the uh, local loyalists that intelligence is more important than soldiers. Um, he is going to create a network of spies all over the southern backcountry, and he is going to um, offer uh, cash bounties. He says, look, you don't need to risk yourself. You can stay inside. You can just count the rebels when they go by, or even better, just count cattle. If you see a wagon full of, full of cornmeal, count the bags. He says knowing how much food they're taking is the best way to know how many men they actually have with them. And if your tip, if your little anonymous feedback actually leads to a British victory, you can be rewarded not just with, hey, thanks, good job, but 50 to 100 guineas. And a guinea is 21 shillings. Um, so you're looking at a, a lot of money, a lot of British coin coming your way if one of your tips helps defeat the rebels. Um, what else is he going to do? Ferguson is going to realize that a lot of these leaders, they're very charismatic. They're community leaders, both loyalist and patriot. And uh, many of these patriot guys are good guys. Um, they can be talked to. They're, they're, they're intelligent guys. Um, so he tries to uh, make contact with them. He's going to try and get proclamations, get letters into the right hands of a few key people. And he says, look, if we can just get a few of these leaders to come to our side, all of their communities, all their followers would come back into the British army, into the loyalist militia with them. So he's going to send out paroled prisoners on September 12th, 1780. He's going to put these offers, these letters into the hands of these paroled prisoners um, under their oath that they're going to take it back to some of the last holdouts. Now, Ferguson is also going to order the Loyalist militia to be careful. Um, he's like, look, I want help, but don't expose yourself to any unnecessary danger. Um, if your property is already destroyed, if you don't have a place to go, sure, come on to camp. We'll take you in. We'll feed you. But if you can hold on where you're at, stay there. Wait for me to get there to support you. Um, he says, quote, show no offense or injury to any rebels who remain at home and show peaceful submission help protect them and the women and children of all sides and denominations. The best step to peace is keeping the loyal militia from violence and injustice. The only rebels who would seek to continue are those in power and guilty of crimes who wish to continue the public troubles with a view of enriching themselves by plunder and violence. And then goes on to speak further against plundering saying, quote, loyalists who by plunder and outrage disgrace the name of loyalists will be punished even to death as scoundrels who wish to continue to their country the miseries of war. Um, so a very interesting approach you see coming from Patrick Ferguson. Spies, intelligence, that's the most important part, but just get the message out of peace, protection, stability. Um, September 14th, 1780, you see some of the effects of this. One of his officers notes that, quote, the deluded people, meaning the rebels, uh, they came in very fast. They say they never heard of any terms being offered, but have always been kept in ignorance and told of the cruelty of the English. One poor woman expressed great surprise at seeing our men so mild. She asked if there was not heathens in our army that eat children. She had been told there was. They have never seen a proclamation. End quote. Um, Ferguson kind of builds on this. He later writes, quote, the rebel inhabitants here have been kept much in the dark. They are surprised at their treatment and declare that few, if any, would have gone off, meaning gone off to hide and keep fighting, had we not been misinterpreted. Um, so you see Ferguson very much advocating for peace. Uh, this little note that you have here, let me remove my screen so you can see the rest of that. Um, there is at one point he even advocates for the Loyalist Militia from 96 District, South Carolina, who have been in service with uh, Ferguson for a while. He's like, look, they have missed out on a crop. Their neighbors who have stayed behind have been profiting. We need to give them more money. Cornwallis approves and Ferguson gives them a gift. Um, 
Now, Ferguson's spy network, real quick note about these guys. He's even hearing uh, reports from Kentucky when you have British allied uh, Shawnee Nation and other native warriors are coming down from kind of the uh, Ohio Great Lakes area and attacking some of the settlements in Kentucky. Ferguson's hearing about it and passing it on to Cornwallis. <coughs> So again, the effect of this uh, diff different approach, September 24th, 1780, one of Ferguson's officers writes that 500 subjects came in, also a number of ladies. So he's very effective in North Carolina, convincing people to come back. Um, but what they're also hearing is that there's been a rebel attack on Augusta, Georgia. It's failed, they're being pursued. He is notified by Lord Cornwallis that that is now his principal object, his first object. He needs to go out and either intercept this force of uh, Georgia patriots or at least get information on where they are and where they're moving. They believe they're heading north towards kind of the Tennessee mountain border. Now, talking about these guys, real quick, this uh, image here on the side uh, by Don Troiani, this is the kind of soldier that Ferguson is having the big problem with, these mounted riflemen, these guys who know the terrain, they know their weapons, they know their horses, um, very effective in small, small bands, small parties, and this is what Ferguson is wanting to use for the Loyalists. Now, we are going to um, get further into September, and things are gonna get a little hairy. September 19th, 1780, Ferguson is going to get his first report of this gathering happening across the Blue Ridge Mountains in what's now Eastern Tennessee. Um, his report says 800 men are gathering. Their plans are to get about 800 guys together and then cross over the mountain and get on the Eastern side and attack the British. He says, I'm not worried about it. I doubt they'll have more than 300. He knows the names of all their officers. He knows where they're gathering, where they're coming from. Again, Ferguson's spy network is incredible. Um, he's talking about these guys on the 19th. The gathering, the gathering doesn't even happen until the 25th, uh, but Ferguson knows it's going to happen. They're talking about it. Um, September 22nd, uh, he gets more reports of these guys, but he's not expecting them. So he knows they're going to be gathering here on the map over here in, uh, in East Tennessee. But he says they're likely going to come through Flower Gap. So he's expecting them to come all the way up following the kind of easier wagon trails into Southwest Virginia and then coming down through kind of um, Fancy Gap area um, down kind of what's now I-77, uh, the well-known wagon routes. He is not expecting them to go up and over the ridges but around. And again, he says, they yeah, have sure there's going to be a lot um, coming, but I doubt their numbers will be that many. He also starts to hear that there's Yadkin Valley Patriots gathering as well, planning to join up with these guys. But again, he doubts their numbers. So again, that's September 22nd. He hears about this plan, even though the Yadkin Valley guys won't depart until the 27th. Uh, so kind of interesting, the time difference here with, between Ferguson knowing something's going to happen and then it actually takes place. Uh, September 24th and 25th, you have these Overmountain Rebels begin to gather over here in Sycamore Shoals. Uh, like I mentioned just a second ago, the 27th, um, the Yakin Valley guys begin to move. But that same day, you have the Overmountain group go over the mountain. This is going to be that big surprise for Ferguson. They go, don't go around up through Virginia. They come across a Yellow Mountain Gap between Yellow and Roan Mountain. Um, September 28th, you are going to see Ferguson receive numerous reports of different rebel bodies moving around the area. But again, he doubts their numbers. He says, he says oh, the Overmountain guys are supposed to have 800. I doubt it. Yadkin Valley is supposed to have 300. I doubt it. Um, he believes that these groups are trying to get together and push towards 96, the British fort down there. So he says, this is a great happening. I've been chasing these guys for months. I can't catch them up here in these mountains, in these hills. But if I just get in this right position, between all of these groups, they can't unite. I can pick them off as they come, and they'll never reach the British fort at 96. Uh, he writes to Lord Cornwallis in this same report. He says, look, if I just had some good cavalry here, I'll be able to chase them down and defeat them. He's like, I've got about 500 militia with me right now. There's 500 more from the Catawba River coming over to join me. So if I just had, you know, 400 reinforcements, um, you know, some mounted infantry, some cavalry, I'll be able to take these guys on. Um, now, September 30th, this is when you kind of get this oh no moment. 
September 30th, Ferguson is going to receive a report that the Ulmer Mountain Group, he says, ah, there's no way they'll have 800. They have 1,000, and those numbers get confirmed. The Yadkin Valley guys, there's no way they'll have 300. They have 500. Uh, so these numbers are even bigger than Ferguson, even in his wildest dreams, feared. Uh, he starts to get a little more nervous about this. Um, there are scouts constantly coming in. His spies are coming in. Um, on this day, September 30th, you have uh, six scouts who were actually at the gathering up here at Sycamore Shoals in what's now Tennessee. They were at the muster. They were at the gathering, and they have now reached Ferguson's camp to warn him. So kind of famously with our story, there's two uh, Patriot deserters, um, James Crawford and Samuel Chambers, that we kind of remember as being the main ones. I mean, some of the stories sound like the only ones to try and warn Ferguson, but no, he had a network of guys. So six total come from that gathering and they come and warn Ferguson. Um, but still Ferguson thinks, hey, I can catch these guys. I can defeat them before they unite. Um, he writes that hey, maybe they'll be on the eastern side of the mountains by October 1st. Little does he know they are already on the eastern side of the mountains. They're already coming south by October 1st. Um, so these guys, because of the way they crossed, um, they are moving much faster, much closer than Ferguson feared, and he's just confirmed their numbers are way more than he ever imagined. On October 1st, Ferguson is going to try to rally additional reinforcements. Um, if these reports of the rebel numbers are true, they outnumber his army easily, so he needs help. And he writes his proclamation. He says, quote, gentlemen, unless you wish to be eat up, by an inundation of barbarians who have begun by murdering an unarmed son before the aged father and afterwards lopped off his arms and who by their shocking cruelties and irregularities give the best proof of their cowardice and want of discipline. I say if you wish to be pinioned, robbed, and murdered and see your wives and daughters in just four days abused by the dregs of mankind, in short, if you wish to deserve to live and bear the name of men, grasp your arms in a moment and run to camp. The backwater men have crossed the mountains. McDowell, Hampton, Shelby, and Cleveland are at their head so that you know what you have to depend upon. If you choose to be degraded forever and ever by a set of mongrels, say so at once and let your women turn their backs upon you and look out for real men to protect them. So there you have Ferguson's proclamation. Um, this is going to be trying to rally the Loyalist militia. He refers to a few attacks that were happening um, by some of Ben Cleveland's patriots, the, uh, the murdering the sun, the lopping off arms thing. Um, this comes from a, a, a scout who comes in, brings this story to Ferguson's officers of what happened. And you can see he's naming officers here. He knows who's leading these over mountain men. He now knows their numbers. He knows where they're coming from. He knows roughly where they are, but they're just, they keep moving faster than he's expected. Um, on October 3rd, you uh, have another letter from Ferguson. They have flattered their followers with a very cheap purchase, which is much in our favor. And if their numbers are within bounds, we hope to sell them a bargain. So he's very cocky in this letter to Cornwallis. He says, yeah, they're, they're not really dedicated to their cause. If we can just meet them here on the field of battle, we'll crush them. We'll win. No problem. I just need 800 reinforcements. He requests 400 dragoons and 400 mounted infantry. I don't think even Cornwallis has those numbers, but again, Ferguson thinking with that dragoon mindset, he was a dragoon himself. He knows the value of mounted troops. He's been chasing these mounted frontiersmen all summer. He needs cavalry to catch up with them. October 5th, he says even, even more fears. Hey, I've heard they've been joined by Clark and Sumter. Um, so there are some Georgians, some South Carolinians getting into their numbers, um, though not Thomas Sumter, not Elijah Clark themselves, but some of their guys. Um, he's starting to know that they're going to be meeting soon. He's like, look, forget 800. If I can just get three to 400, again, part Dragoons, he says, quote, he would finish this business. He then says, quote, if your lordship should pleased not to supersede me by sending a senior officer, it will be in addition to the obligation I owe you. So what he means is I need guys, I need help, but please let me be in command. This is my moment. This is my chance to end this mission to prove that these militia can be a, an effective fighting force. Now, the downside here, October 5th, Cornwallis is going to finally write to Ferguson 
that he just received his letters of September 22nd and 28th. The couriers from Ferguson to Cornwallis have been extremely delayed. They're going through heavy rebel territory, having to hide out most of the dangerous travel in the dark at night. Uh, for, Cornwallis says, I cannot help you. I cannot send men to you. If you can get to the Catawba River, the 71st Regiment will be there. The Highlanders are at the riverbank to receive you and guard you, but you cannot stay there. You have to get to me. This letter will never reach Ferguson. He's going to go to his the battlefield, um, believing reinforcements are on the way in just a matter of hours, uh, but he does not know that they're waiting at the Catawba River near Charlotte, unable to get to him. October 6th, he's going to write that, uh, I have taken a post where I do not think I can be forced by a stronger enemy than that against us. Um, he goes from requesting 800 reinforcements to 400 now to 200. He says, I've got some more militia coming. I can count on these guys. But if I just had some good trained cavalry, I can do this. Um, and of course, confident and cocky Ferguson, um, he says um, that, you know, he could probably do it on his own. You know, he doesn't really need the help. He says, quote, but help so near at hand, it appeared to me improper to myself to commit anything to hazard. So since you're so close, since I'm only 30, you know, 30, 35 miles from Charlotte, I'm going to go ahead and request the assistance. And that's on October 6th, 1780. What happens that next day is 910 hand-picked rebel riflemen. They're in the saddle. They've been in the saddle all night long. Uh, they've been chasing Ferguson, some of these guys, for 13 days by this point, and all that morning, they have been uh, confirming their accounts of where Ferguson's camp is, what Ferguson looks like, how many men are in his camp. Uh, Solomon Beeson is gonna be a prisoner recently released from Ferguson's camp. He's gonna be uh, uh, met by the rebels. He's gonna confirm where Ferguson is. Um, local, uh, a local girl confirms Ferguson's campsite. Some more local women confirm that Ferguson is camped on the mountain, kind of tricked into it by uh, Patriot spy Enoch Gilmer. Um, and John Ponder, a 14-year-old loyalist messenger, is captured with Ferguson's last letter and gives a description of Ferguson, um, the camp layout, the location. Um, George Watkins, again, a released prisoner, confirms the location. So these Patriots are just gathering more and more information the closer they get to the camp itself. Uh, Captain Alexander Chesney writes about this moment. He says, quote, we were attacked before any support arrived. Um, he says by 1,500 picked men, it was, it was only 910, but he says it was like 1,500 picked men from Gilbertstown under the command of Cleveland, Selby, and Campbell, all of whom were armed with rifles, well-mounted, and of course could move with the utmost celerity. So rapid was their attack that I was in the act of dismounting to report that all was quiet and the pickets on the alert when we heard their firing about half a mile off. In this manner, the engagement was maintained near an hour, the mountaineers flying whenever there was danger of being charged by the bayonet and returning again as so, so soon as the British detachment had faced about to repel another of their parties. Colonel Ferguson was at last recognized by his gallantry, although wearing a hunting shirt, and fell pierced by seven balls. Another officer, Dr. Oozel Johnson, he writes about that moment. He says, quote, he, meaning Ferguson, then rushed in amongst the rebels with about half a dozen men. He was soon shot from his horse. Another officer, Anthony Allaire, describes it. He says, quote, we lost in this action Major Ferguson of the 71st Regiment, a man much attached to his king and country, well informed in the art of war. He was brave and humane and an agreeable companion. In short, he was universally esteemed in the, in the army and have every reason to regret his unhappy fate. So what you have here in this image from Don Troiani is here's Ferguson wearing his uh, checked hunting shirt. Um, as described by Chesney, other 19th century sources call it a checked duster. Um, and what, you know, there's a couple theories behind this. Uh, one theory is that it was maybe laundry day. He was trying to keep his uniform clean. Um, but looking at how Ferguson approached the Loyalist militia, uh, looking at how he, uh, he, he met with them, he talked with them, he sympathized with them, he was trying to appeal to them. I think he was actually wearing this as a sign of solidarity. 
he is wearing a hunting shirt, a common local garment rather than the uniform of a British officer. He's trying to appear more like one of them than an outsider. I think that's why he wears a checked hunting shirt. Um, but he is shot off of the horse near the end of the fight, trying to lead this last ditch, this last attempt cavalry charge from a few officers um, when the battle's going to end. Now, in the aftermath, there is uh, going to be some looting taking place. Uh, Captain Joseph McDowell is described as securing six of Ferguson's china plates and one cup and saucer from his camp. Colonel Shelby took one large silver whistle of Ferguson's. Uh, um, Elias Powell took one small silver whistle uh, that was supposedly fell from Ferguson's pocket. Colonel John Sevier took Ferguson's silk sash and his lieutenant colonel commission, um, as well as Abraham DePeister's sword, the second in command under Ferguson. Uh, Colonel Campbell took part of Ferguson's letters. Colonel Cleveland was given uh, Ferguson's white horse to replace the one that he had had that was killed in the battle. Um, Samuel Talbot took Ferguson's pistol from under his body. Uh, one of Lacey's men took Ferguson's silver watch, which was described as, quote, round as a turnip. Now, some other later accounts say that Ferguson's body was uh, found by the... Um, found by the, the rebels. It was wrapped in a raw cow's hide and placed in a shallow grave. Other accounts describe it as being um, uh, desecrated uh, by the, the mountain men as they're burying him. Um, the pension application of George Hofstellar noted that he is sharing his grave with Virginia Sow. He said, quote, there was also a woman killed and lay by his side. Um, she is going to be a, a servant, part of Ferguson's camp, um, along with Virginia Paul. Virginia Paul was actually uh, captured by the Patriots. Uh, Virginia Sow killed in the crossfire, which has been confirmed through archaeology over the centuries that there are two uh, human bodies in Ferguson's grave at Kings Mountain National Military Park, which can be visited to this day. Now, Cornwallis, he's going to report about this to uh, Sir Henry Clinton. He says that the Loyalist militia in Western Carolina, quote, was so totally disheartened by the defeat of Ferguson that of the whole district, we could with difficulty assemble 100. And even those, I am convinced, would not have made the smallest resistance if they had been attacked. Uh, with the loss of Ferguson, the hope, the fighting spirit of the South Carolina Loyalist militia is gone. Um, they have lost some of their best soldiers, their best leaders, um, their husbands, their brothers, their fathers, and their fighting spirit is very injured with this. Um, Judge Landrum, a 19th century historian in South Carolina, who did a lot of American Revolution research. He described Ferguson, quote, as a, uh, a finished soldier, and his bearing throughout his military career proved him as brave as a lion. He says he was an intelligent man of eminent literary talents who was deemed by other writers and contemporary sages equal to the best author of the Scottish Augustan age. He was possessing a vigorous mind and brilliant parts. He early displayed inventive genius, sound judgment, and intrepid heroism. He was pleasant and conciliatory in manner and was well calculated to gain friends." End quote. But that's not what's remembered about Patrick Ferguson. Um, instead, he is remembered over the centuries of stories as an arrogant British officer who, is, who threatened the frontiersmen with um, hanging, burning, destruction, fire and sword if they did not submit to other British officers. And he got killed at King's Mountain as a lesson to any other high and mighty British officers. Um, now, that legend has survived despite the fact that the first and really only evidence of that kind of threat comes from Isaac Shelby in um, 43 years after the battle in a pamphlet he wrote in the 1820s where he makes that fire and sword reference, says it was a verbal message, a verbal warning, despite Patrick Ferguson telling Cornwallis that he has written out the proclamation and put it into the hands of trusty parole prisoners to conduct the officers. But that's the power of stories. The more exciting the story is, the more they reinforce that, hey, we, the Americans, the Patriots, we were the good guys and the other people were the bad guys. Um, the more that these stories reinforce that, the more they get remembered and the more they get shared. So that's why to this day, Patrick Ferguson is likely the most hated Scotsman in the Carolinas, despite what everything else has had to say about him. So that is our story of a deeper look at Patrick Ferguson. Was he really that hated Scotsman? And then was he really deserving of maybe that title? 
So I hope you enjoyed this part three of our series. I hope you enjoyed the whole series and now have a little better understanding of why those three short words, why here Ferguson fell, made such an impact to the Southern Loyalists and the British Army on the Southern Campaign. So the next time you hear about Ferguson, I hope you share a little bit of this other story as well. So I hope you enjoyed. Again, I'm Ranger William with the Overmountain Victory National Historic Trail. Thank you for watching.